try to, uh, some of us, including myself, are a little long-winded, so <laughs> try to keep it fairly short. Try to keep up? <laughs> uh, thank you, thank Sorry you. about that. I have a cheat sheet that uh, I see many folks Just so do. you know, we can go after eight, so a few more people have to speak. Oh, good, I have an hour then. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, earlier I heard reference to uh, my Mark Nick moniker, which is Clapper. Uh, I'm Jim Clapp. And uh, I spent a lot of time with Mike in the 70s and some in the 80s, and then time sort of and, and distance sort of separated us. Um, and I'm the poorer for it, and I really wish that I had kept in touch. But uh, let me put my dollar store cheaters on. I'm still lucky that I can uh, go in and buy glasses by the dozen. Uh, to state that Mike was a memorable person is an understatement. Mike was a force of nature. He was. And uh, if I were to write it to the Reader's Digest, if they even have that section anymore, he would be my most unforgettable character. Um, so we. Mike and I did a lot of things together and did it with a number of folks who have already been up here to speak about him and some will later. But right now, I just want to sort of take a survey here. And I'm going to start listing some things I did with Mike. And this is by no means everything. And I just would like a show of hands. And there's some things that I might ask. And because there are cameras rolling, you might not want to put your hands up. But, um, so how, how many folks here have gone fishing with Mike? Yeah, fly fishing, ice fishing, whatever. Um, right, I heard Peter Williams' his name earlier, and I believe that's a brother of a Wes Williams, whom I met through Mike, lived in, uh, in Lexington, and uh, he was... <laughs> oh, you know this one, right? Yeah, so Wes was... He was his own character, and uh, he liked fishing, especially liked ice fishing, and um, there was a, a time when there was the thinnest crust of ice on the lake. Quarter inch, three eighths, whatever. And we're going, ah, oh, well, we gotta wait till this freezes over. Not Wes. He gets out of the trunk these plywood discs about yay big around. Straps him to his feet, and he's slowly gliding himself out onto the fro partially frozen lake. Meanwhile, we're on the shore, and we can see the ice going <laughs> like this. Well, these are the kinds of characters that Mike gathered unto himself. And I won't even go to that Scott stock scam. I don't know, did you get it about that? The guy could buy and own everyone in this room. Oh, jeez. I know. Uh, so how many people, and, and I heard some from uh, two Thai flyers and, uh, and some folks who, uh, I, I guess I consider myself lucky because he didn't charge me yes. directly uh, to learn how to tie fly. So how many here have tied flies with Mike? Right. And I, and I heard the term Rangely, and that, he was really famous for those Rangely flies. Um, anybody here ever make a model with Mike? I know somebody was given one. Yeah, he was a, a model maker. He loved those planes. And uh, he liked to decorate them. Uh, you know, he liked to put bullet holes in them and burn them. And <laughs> so they, you know, they saw action because he, oh yeah, he, a perfect model. And I kind of he wanted realism. Um, yeah. Some people leaving here that okay. were very instrumental in Michael's last days and made them oh. better, made Michael a better person. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, Thank so you very much. And for and for Isma, and for Diane. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. God bless. He couldn't have been easy. <laughs> So he loved planes. 
Um, anybody here ever play music with him? Because he was a harp player. Anybody? I, yeah. Okay, we got one. Uh, I play drums, um, and uh, most of the music I played, most of the music I played with Mike was at a fraternity house, MIT fraternity house, the Delta Tau Delta, uh, Delta Tau, whatever it was, Delta, uh, yes, whatever, Delta Tau Delta, I think it was, um, and uh, we had an informal group of frat brothers, and there was Michael and myself, um, and he gave us the name, and one of, one of the, uh, I think the bass player was uh, John Deakman. I, I hoped he'd be here tonight. Um, so the name of the band was Cannibal John Deakman and the All Night Pygmy Blues Band. <laughs> and that was a Michael moniker. Um, yeah, and geez, we had James Montgomery come and play at the frat house for all the beer they could drink. <laughs> Simple. Um, anybody here attend a concert with Mike? Yeah, so there were probably there are loads of folks here who probably went to some of those Nighthawk concerts. Um, how about the one that got shut down at, uh, uh, let's see, where was that? Oh, Jim Blandino's father's place up in wherever that was, Salem. Yeah, the cops were pounding on the door for hours. <laughs> the door was locked and you had to have the key to the, uh, uh, to the lift to get up to the third floor. The neighbors were complaining like hell, but it was a great concert. <laughs> Um, anybody go to a movie with him? <laughs> yeah. So, I spent a couple of years in, in Kenya, and uh, I even kept up correspondence with Mike in Kenya. He sent me a photograph, uh, he clipped out of the Stone Independent, of Spot Pond, drained dry. He goes, any boy from Stoneham would want to see this, and he sent that to me. So I was so happy, I wrote him a letter, folded up some of the local herb in the letter, and shipped it back to him. <laughs> he liked that. <laughs> Anybody go bird watching with Mike? Yeah. Look at all those hands. Yeah. So uh, he got me involved in bird watching. I, I like birds, but I never really took it too seriously. But he turned me into a more serious bird watcher. Um, we would go up to Plum Island. We would go into Cambridge to the cemetery that is. Mount Auburn, yeah, for the spring warblers. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. And uh, uh, like three years in a row, he dragged me and uh, several other crew members down to uh, Cape May, New Jersey for the fall migration, which was awesome. Um, you don't want to sleep in the same room with Mike. <laughs> uh, one of the places that we did bird watch, Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge, you know where that is? So, one day, it was he and I, sky is overcast, but it's not one of those flat ceilings. This has got a lot of texture to it, cumulus clouds, silver, gray, pure color, rimmed in light silver, you know, so real pretty, and some spots of sunlight, but further to the west, the sky was a bit clearer. And as the sun broke and dropped down to the west, it managed to light the underside of these clouds, and they became golden. And we were looking at that, thinking how wonderful it was, and how, how could it possibly be better when we heard this roar? And I mean, it was one of these roars that could shake your bones. And maintaining the legal 200 feet elevation limit over any national wildlife area was a P-51 Mustang. Roaring overhead under those gold-lit clouds right over Great Meadows. Must have come out of uh, Hanscom, I imagine. And uh, we had to pick one another up. It was just awesome. So what rock climbing, and yeah, he, he did rock climb. He got me interested in rock climbing. 
Um, we climbed at Quincy Quarries. He took, took me to the gunks. Um, we used to roam around all through um, Malden, Mel Melrose, the Fells Way, looking for little ledges hidden out God knows where. And uh, as time passed, yes, he got a little too heavy for it and he claimed he blew out his shoulders while lifting that much weight. I can understand it. So we just use him as an anchor. <laughs> Uh, belay is the term, really. He would be happy to hold the rope and stand down below and let the rest of us fall. Road trips. Anybody go on a road trip with Mike? Ah, oh, look at that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I went on several. The longest one was out to Salt Lake. Uh, yeah. So, obviously, we're going through Ohio. We have to stop at Wright-Patterson uh, Air Force Base, because they have a huge uh, museum there, Air Force um, Museum, spent the whole day there. It was amazing, and he was uh, happy as could be. And then uh, we drove on um, out to Salt Lake. Uh, car, let's see what the heck was going on. Oh, the car was freezing. We had to get some cardboard to put in front of the radiator so that the, the uh, whatever. Um, and we got to Salt Lake and I, uh, I put him on a plane, bought a coach ticket, and here's, here's Mike, here's the seat, good luck Mike, <laughs> and he flew home. Um, and because the, cam because the cameras are rolling, I won't even mention why we were making that trip, but <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. Um, anybody go to the theater with him? See a performance of some sort. Yeah, non music. Okay, good. Anybody go up to, uh, I think it was Beverly, the Cabot Theater, to see the Grand David? Oh, uh, yeah, the magic show. He, yeah, first time I went, it was with him. You did? Great. First time I went, we went with him, and it, I think it's during intermission that the whole cast comes out. And I mean, this theater is owned by the cast members. And back in 2012, it was the 35th anniversary, so it's got to be 40th something, if they're still doing it. Marvelous show, wonderful fun. I think it was in intermission, the whole cast came out, and the audience can come down and talk to them, da 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 oh, man, Charlie, Mikey came up. And here's what he says to the, uh, the elder statesman of the, of, of the uh, cast. Man, this is more fun than an albino pygmy bowling team. <laughs> Yeah, he had his own vocabulary. Um, dining. <laughs> yeah, this would be ridiculous. Anybody go and eat with that? Yeah, 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 right, exactly. Anybody go to Michael's Grand Cru, which was up on the pike? Yeah, anybody go to his 40th birthday party there? Ah, uh -huh. good. Yeah, a lot of fun. Um, uh, the girl I was dating at the time suggested that I hire a belly dancer for it, and I said, oh, this is a great idea. And, uh, and, but, and so I had a belly dancer show up, and I had thought of a stripper, but I figured, no, this is a classy place. Come to find out they've had strippers there before. That would have been more fun. But um, I didn't realize that Mike had recently had a knee operation. And should have stayed in his chair when the girl was dancing. But no! He's up there. And then he says, you should have hired her to come to my house. Oh, <laughs> oh God, no, he can't. Okay, so. I'm going to make this short, and I'm going to leave you another one of uh, Mike's colorful and remarkable descriptive utterances. And, um, I'm, I'm not infectious now, don't worry about it. Not that I'm inviting kisses or anything, but uh, I had been suffering from a cold. Luckily, it never went any lower than about here. But thinking about coming here and speaking to all of you in remembrance of of Miguel, I call him Miguel and Mikey, I never call him Butchie, but I just wasn't around at that time, I guess. Um, reminded me of something that he referred to, and when he found himself with 
certain symptoms of a cold, and he said he found himself hacking up baggies of coffee jello. <laughs> and that was Mike. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay, Laxadia. Okay, finally. <laughs> okay. So, I first met Mike probably in the late 1980s, and it was through my brother-in-law. Um, his name is Joe Delgaitis. Very good friends with Mike. He couldn't be here tonight because he's in Florida. Um, Joe D. has no, knew Mike since, I want to say, the mid-70s. I think Mike worked at, or knew somebody at the Landmark School which is where my sister and her, Jay Barry, Barry. right. And so that was the connection. And then they obviously had a, a, a connection with the wine and, and there is Roger Orman here tonight. Um, Debbie, Roger. Um, and that was the other connection. Um, Brookline Liquors, I want to say. Yeah. Um, so my brother-in-law asked me to say a couple of stories on his behalf and then we'll talk about my relationship with Mike. Um, so the Landmark School was very much a very liberal, hippie type environment back during that time. And Mike mentioned this to me as well. So there, there was a party going on and they were all dancing and they were hopped up on blow and everything else. And they're listening to The Grateful Dead and I don't know how I'm assuming you all know Mike's opinion on the Grateful Dead. Oh, yeah. Endless noodling on the guitar. Um, so they're all having a good time, and Mike walks in and just goes right up to the record player and whoosh, and puts on a blues record. And the whole party just, you know, boom. And there was a guy there, his name was Dr. Bob, um, short little guy, he had a mustache. And, um, <laughs> and he walks up to Mike and goes, he's doing the mustache like this, and Mike used to do this too. Um, hey man, what are you doing? That was the Grateful Dead. And you know, Mike's towering over him. Is, and Mike just loved to retell that story over and over. It was like a chainsaw cutting right through that flower power garden. Um, <laughs> um, so, the other thing about Mike was that he was an entrepreneur, um, and so was my brother-in-law. So, my brother-in-law used to sell him quarter pounds or half pounds, and then Mike would, um, Mike would chop it up into smaller pieces and sell it off to his buddies. Um, so, my brother-in-law goes over there one day and, and gives him the stuff, and, and Mike you know, starts chopping it up, and, and he's got a bowl of pebbles and he starts dropping pebbles into each bag to, to the weight so he could squeeze out another package to sell. <laughs> Years later, I went to his house and I caught him, he had a spray bottle and he was spraying the weed um, and then putting it in the bag to add weight. Um, <laughs> so they had this long relationship and I had recently, I had moved to Stoneham probably in 88, 89 and my brother wants to say, I got this guy, he lives down the street, you guys should hang out, and I'm going over there for, um, you know, we're gonna hang out, whatever. So I go over there with him, and my brother-in-law had a nickname for me, it was called Weasel. And Mike latched right onto that, and instead of Weasel, he would call me the Wheeze. <laughs> so my very first time I go over there, and, and, and my brother-in-law was like, Mike, show him the basement. <laughs> so I go down there and, and you know, he's got the, the planes hanging, um, he's got the monkey fetus in the jar, um, he's got the Japanese uh, World War II rifle with the notches on it, and he's, you know, showing me all that. I'm like, this guy's really cool. I'm like 20, I'm 22, 23, very impressionable. This guy is really cool. Um, eccentric, but cool. Um, so we developed a friendship, and I live nearby, and, and, you know, he's teaching me about wine and good food, and, and, Mike, I'm going to come over, I'm going to bring uh, the Hellraiser 2 video, let's watch that. He loved horror movies. Him and I watched so many horror movies, I, I can't even count. We went to the movies to see the remake of Night of the Living Dead, he laughed through the whole thing. Um, so, 
you know, Mike, I'm coming over. I'm bringing Hellraiser 2. All right, right. By the way, stop at Angelo's. Um, give me two chicken parm. So it was like every time. I could... <laughs> and a few times you go to Angelo's, and he had such a good relationship with those guys. You know, after dinner, and man, he just bring it out. You know, and he, had, he had his bottle of Sambuca that, you know, the guy kept for him. Um, so again, I'm hanging out with them, and uh, I'm over there one night, and he's like, I've got these two uh, Bruins tickets, and, you know, I can't go, do you know anybody? And I was working with a guy, his name was Kip, Kip Manso, and um, I, I, he loved hockey, so I'm like, this, yeah, this kid Kip, he'll, he'll buy him from you, but, but I don't want to get involved, here's his phone number, you guys connect. So they connect, and yep, Kip's going to take the tickets, he's going to pay Mike for them, um, he's gonna come by that night, and Kip's a no-show. So Mike had to eat the tickets. And for the next three weeks, this son of a bitch, Kip, you till I ever see him, I'm gonna kick his ass. That he kept going on and on about it. So, like a year or two later, Mike decides he wants to actually work for a living. Um, and we were at uh, a company, I had already left, but the company was called CompuGraphic, and Kip worked there. And <laughs> Kip and his brother like ran. They were like the they were like the, the mini mafia within the organization. They 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 knew everybody. They got away with everything. Um, and somehow Mike talked these people into hiring him. And it was a telemarketing job. So you're on the phones all day, banging out calls, trying to sell uh, typesetting equipment, uh, chemicals, things like that. Um, a lot of the guys that worked there were pretty uh, pretty slick like used car salesman's type, and you know, Mike caught on to that right off the bat. So, most of the time, when you go by Mike's cubicle, this is what they were telling me before they fired him, he was never on the phones. Um, they'd catch him kind of sitting back in his chair, picking crumbs oh, off of his shirt and <laughs> right after lunch. So, so Mike um, exits the company, you know, he's bitter, um, and the whole time hated Kip, and the company was going nowhere because it was, it was film processing stuff. So um, they start riffing and, and, and downsizing and so on. But I had moved on. I was working at a, um, a headhunting firm. And Mike would call me at just out of the blue. You know, I'd pick up the phone more. I'd see the, hey, Wheeze. Is Kip still working there? <laughs> like, Mike, I'm, I'm working. I can't. So I, I started to not take his calls. And then I get a call uh, from the receptionist. She's like, there's a Mike Martino on the phone. I go, okay. So I pick it up. I was like, I knew you'd take the call. All you guineas, you all stick together. <laughs> so, so it's like six, seven years removed from him leaving Agfa, and he's still going on about Kip. So finally, Kip gets let go, and <laughs> I call him. I'm like, Mike, guess what? Wow, Kip's gone. Ah, oh, finally, that son of a bitch. He was so happy. I mean, he, he, this guy held grudges. Fred, you said it. He held grudges better than he held jobs. <laughs> um, but Mike had a big heart too. Um, and I recall that when my brother-in-law and sister um, were trying to have a kid, they, they couldn't have children, so they adopted, and they had their first son, and it's my nephew, Marco, um, and Mike was, was overjoyed, and when my nephew started to grow hair, um, Mike asked for a clipping, and made a fly out of it, and gave it to my uh, sister and her husband, and they still have that. Um, a, a character. Uh, <laughs> I just have to ask, is the guy from Jay Bildner here? <laughs> no? Good. So, so Mike, um, as I mentioned, was an entrepreneur. Um, dealt with some other things. Um, so he had this guy from Jay Bildner who loved his uh, Peruvian marching powder. And the guy didn't have much money, so Mike would barter with all of the delicacies from Jay Bildner. This guy would bring in the caviar and all the high-end stuff, and Mike would do these things. So we had another guy, um, he called him the Pigeon. 
because Mike used to step all, step all over his, his stuff. Um, and this guy wind, wound up like owing Mike a, a, a ton of money. And at one point, the guy calls, he's like, I need something. So Mike's like, oh yeah, come, come on by, come on by. Um, the guy comes by, gives him some money, and Mike gave him a package of baking soda and sent him on his way. <laughs> and it's when he's like, that son of a bitch, he's <laughs> Um Mike taught me a lot about wine, good food. Um, I'll never forget that about him. Um, I, I miss him. I, I spent a good number of years sitting in that living room with him, in his chair, in his underwear, um, with nothing else on. Um, <laughs> uh, that was always a sight to behold. Um, I had a bunch of friends that worked at, at Agfa, CompuGraphic, um, that knew him as well, and he had this magnetism about him, um, where they all, we'd all go to his house and hang out, and we'd watch old hockey movies, and, you know, he was like the, the, the wise Buddha. I mean, he was that guy in the chair that just, you know, these pearls of wisdom. Um, that, He's always going to have an impression, a big impression on me, and I know you're all here for the same reason. Um, I truly miss Mike, um, and, and I know he's looking down on us. So thank you, um, and, and thank you for letting me talk. Thanks very much, Mike.